Greetings, everybody. Listen, this uh, is the Isaiah chapter 13 is the mentions the day of the Lord. And there are people that will tell you that the day of the Lord and the day of Christ is two different events, essentially denying that Jesus is Lord. Uh, personally, I think the day of the Lord and the day of Christ is the same event. It happens at the end of the tribulation period. And um, what can I tell you? So conti let's continue. Isaiah 13, day of the Lord. Now, everybody remember this. There's two ways of looking at the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. Those that are in Christ, when things are really, really bad, people are going to be begging for his return. But for the wicked, it's going to be a day they're going to regret. But for those that are in Christ, it's going to be a day of salvation. Just like the days of Noah. It was judgment and destruction upon the wicked world, but for Noah, it was sal his salvation from the giants of the earth. Now, I haven't totally researched it, but I be believe that when it talks about the day of the Lord, it's talking about judgment upon the unsaved. And then when it's talking about the day of Christ, it's talking about the salvation of those who are in Christ. I haven't totally searched that out, but I think that's how it works. I'm not 100% sure, but just know this, that things are going to be so bad that people are going to be begging for Christ to return. And your average church person, uh, their theology is so bad because they've been lied to by all the, the goats. and But not only that, they don't bother to read scriptures that many people died to give us. I mean, John Wycliffe, he died to give us the Bible in our own language. He spent a large portion of his life translating the scriptures into our own language so that we can read it and most people don't bother. I don't think the Lord's going to have much sympathy when he says, well, let's see, you've spent 18 hours reading the Bible and you spent 18,632 hours and 22 minutes and 13 seconds watching television and movies. I don't think he's going to have much sympathy for those people when they do the things that he hates and neglects to do the things that he loves. So that's just, that's just my opinion. All right. Greetings, everybody. Today is August 5th, 2017. It is Saturday, the Sabbath day. I'm not much of a Sabbath keeper, but I just thought I would point that out. A lot of times, that's what I do on the Sabbath day. I do Bible studies. And uh, just remember something. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And remember something. I'm a volunteer. I don't get paid to do these things. I don't have a church that pays me. I don't have anybody that gives me any money. And you've heard the old saying, you get what you pay for. Well, Jesus uh, said, freely you have received, freely give. I believe that was Jesus that said that. I'm not sure. Maybe I should check it out, huh? Yep, Jesus said it. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8, Jesus said, heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, 
freely give. Oh, yeah. See, when somebody gives you a gift, to you it's free, but it costs whoever gives you the gift. And Christ gave us the gift of eternal life by his blood. It cost him plenty. All right, a little, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 13. Now, Isaiah was a contemporary, evidently, with uh, Daniel and with Jeremiah. Daniel was started writing his book. He was Daniel was a evidently a prince among the tribe of Judah. And Isaiah and Jeremiah wrote of the judgment of Judah for their sin, wickedness, their disobedience to the Lord. Now Prior to this, Israel, northern Israel, whose capital was Samaria, whose one of their kings was King Ahab, he, they were taken into captivity, slavery basically, by the Assyrian Empire. And they were taken from their land and they never returned to the land. Well, a, a, t a time later, I'm not sure exactly how many years, but the southern kingdom of Judah, they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And that is the background of what this is written by. The children of Judah spent 70 years in captivity to Babylon. You see, just like God took Israel and brought them into Egypt by the famine at the hands of Joseph, and then in the time of Moses, he brought them out. But evidently, you can take, God took Israel out of Egypt, but he couldn't take Egypt out of Israel. Uh, it's just, you know, they they wanted to go back to Egypt in their hearts and then their spirit and their mind. Well, so that is the theme of Isaiah 13. And Isaiah is probably the most quoted book in the New Testament. I believe it is. So, all right. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 1. Please read along with me. Now, for those of you that are of the opinion that the uh, day of Christ and the day of the Lord are two different events, please stick with me with this Bible study. Now, remember two things. Well, maybe three. One, sometimes the Bible will be talking about the present. Then it'll jump to the future, and then it'll go back to the past, and then it'll go back to the present, all within one paragraph. And that's what Isaiah 13 does. It talks about the present, then the future, and then it goes back to the present. And the day of the Lord is judgment upon the wicked. And the day of Christ is the salvation of those that are in the faith, the blood-washed, spirit-filled, born-again believers of all the ages. Is it the same event? Is it a different event? Is one the pre-trib rapture and the other the when Christ returns in glory to bring judgment and destruction upon the earth? Well, that's what we're here to find out. And I went to Bible college for six years, a Baptist Bible college. I know exactly what they teach, and I know what the Bible teaches. Sometimes it lines up, sometimes it doesn't. But if you have never read the entire Old Testament and the New Testament, turn your TV off, get rid of it. You will find that you have time 
You know, I just can't believe the uh, amount of time people waste watching television. And, uh, you know, people are going to be shocked. And unfortunately, uh, television is poison. And people get their ideas from it. So, all right. Isaiah 13, chapter 1. I mean, chapter 13, verse 1. The burden of Babylon. So, Babylon was the first major kingdom. And they came and conquered Judah and took him captive. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. Exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger. Even them that rejoice in my highness. I'm beginning to think, I, I kind of of the opinion that the sanctified ones are, are God's holy angels. Two-thirds of the angels are holy. One-third of the angels are not. They follow the devil and Satan in their rebellion against God. And sometimes, when you read the Bible, it'll have a physical present application, but it'll also have a spiritual application for the future, and that's what we're getting ready to, to look at right now. Verse 4, the noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts mustereth, mustereth the host of the battle. They come from a far country. Babylon was a far country. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven. Even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Ooh. They come from a far country, even from the end of heaven? Uh, the weapons of his indignation. You know what indignation is? It's extreme hatred to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. You see, there was a physical application of this. And then there's a end, there is an end times spiritual application of this. Sometimes the Lord will show you something that's happening right now and compare it to what's going to happen in the end. And I think that's what's happening here. They come from a far country from the end of heaven. Isn't God going to gather his angels together and come in the clouds to bring destruction upon the wicked when he finally comes back? That's what we read in Revelation. They come from a far country from the end of heaven, even the Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. That's what this study is called, the day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Now I ask you, is Jesus Christ Lord? How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. A woman given birth. Does that hurt? Uh... Guys, I, I don't know how to, uh, I cannot, I've, I've never given birth. I can't explain it, but um, 
Can you imagine you're in the bathroom doing number two and something the size of a baby comes out? Would that hurt? That's the only thing I could even imagine that could compare. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed, amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. You see... Sometimes the Bible writes warnings for the unbelievers. I mean, they can read this and dismiss it, you know. But the, but the Lord is righteous. He gives them the warning. Behold, the, and, and remember something, the day of the Lord is, is judgment upon the wicked that rejected his offer of salvation. Matter of fact, let's take a look at something. All right, let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 20, uh, chap, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. Going from 24 to 33. Who's speaking? God is speaking. Because I have called, and ye refused. God called. Yeah, he called you and you had your cell phone off or you rejected the call. You turned the cell phone on. You rejected the call, right? Well, not exactly. Because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand. If you were drowning in the water and somebody rode by with a book, a boat, a boat, not a book, a boat, although the book does save, it's called the Holy Bible, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But they have said it not, which means nothing. But they have said it not, all my counsel. And would none of my reproof, which is correction. I also will laugh at your calamity. You see, God called, but they didn't want it. God stretched out his hand. They didn't want it. They said it nothing. All his words they put they said is is worthless. It's nothing. And he wouldn't and they wouldn't acknowledge when he spanked them, he wouldn't acknowledge they wouldn't acknowledge it. So God called them, he stretched out his hand, he gave them counsel. And he gave them correction. They rejected him. So what's his, what does he say? I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. What's a whirlwind? How, how about a tornado? And your destruction cometh as a whirlwind when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then they shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me early, but they will not find me. For they that hated knowledge, what knowledge? Godly knowledge. The knowledge of the word of God. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. And that's respect, people. And did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They wouldn't, they would, they didn't want nothing to do with the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. When God said judgment, they hated hated his judgment, and they hated him that sent the judgment. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning of the way of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools 
shall destroy them. Have you ever seen people that were so fixed on making money that they had time for nothing else? I have. They didn't have time to help their friends, their family. I, I met people that were wealthy, men. They they wouldn't they wouldn't even trust a woman because oh she's probably knows I'm rich and she's trying to put her digs into me to you know marry me to steal my money. I, I've met people like that. You know what? Die alone with all your money. I got a family member like that. A family member. I'm not going to say who, but I got a family member like that. Loves money far more than the family. Ever. Ever. For the turning of the way of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whosoever hearkeneth Hearken means to listen. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. All right, let's go back to Isaiah. Verse 9. 13.9 Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, Oh, wait. Yeah. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. That means destruction, people. Desolate means empty. You want to see a desolate land? Go in the middle of the Sahara Desert. There's nothing there but sand. Cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy, destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Do you know that this, well, let's take a look where it talks about the uh, the sun and the, the moon, the sun becoming dark. Let's take a look at that. All right, let's take a look. Uh, before we continue with Isaiah, let's take a look at 2 Kings chapter 23. I love reading about this king. There was a king, probably the last good king of Judah. Now, when you read the first and second books of Kings and Chronicles, you will realize Israel and Judah were two separate kingdoms. They had different kings, different capitals. Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. Samaria was the capital of Israel. Israel went into apostasy first. Judah went into apostasy after. And uh, let's take a look. Now I want you to think about something. The Lord had made a covenant with Israel and Judah. And, you know, he doesn't like idolatry. And he doesn't like people worshiping the devil. I mean, after all, if you want to worship the devil like they do in India, they may not call him the devil, but they do worship the Indian devil. And if you pray to the devil for food and you die of starvation, well, guess what? You're not going to get anything from the Lord. Lord's going to be like, oh, you want to pray to the devil for food? Go pray to the devil. Go. But I'm not going to feed you. You know, if, if a child is hungry, he's going to ask his father 
or his mother for something to eat, right? You're not going to go to a, a stranger. You're not going to go to a neighbor. I mean, the neighbor might feed you, but he you know, might not. You're not my kid. Get out of here. You know? Well, and imagine if, uh, if you were married to a spouse and all that spouse did all day long was uh, brag about the uh, other good-looking person that they wanted to be with. I mean, you know, if, if you had a wife that didn't want to be with her husband anymore and kept running off with another man or or you ha or, or there was a guy that was married to a woman and, and she wouldn't come home and just wanted to go play around with some other guy or another woman for that matter. Nowadays, you never know. I mean, you know, what's really sad is... Uh, a woman marries a man, and then she, he, he cheats on his wife with another man. That happens a lot. So, uh, you know, that's how the Lord feels when people worship the things of his creation. I mean, it's, it's no small thing. Believe me, it's no small thing. And if you want to worship the devil, Lord will let you worship the devil. But, but when uh, it's time for the devil to go into the lake of fire, well, guess what? You get to join him. So let's read 2 Kings chapter 23. King Josiah, I'm looking forward to meeting him one day. I hope that I'm worthy to meet him one day. Verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 1. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which is found in the house of the Lord. He's reading the word of God, people. The things that God wanted his children to do. You know, like the Ten Commandments. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. What's a covenant? It's a promise. It's like a contract. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul to perform the words of this covenant which were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord, all the vessels that were made for Baal, B-A-A-L. Baal is just another name for Satan. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the keepers of the door to bring forth out, out of the temple of the Lord, all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove, which is love, a grove of trees to worship in. And for the grove and for all the host of heaven, that's the fallen angels. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them into Bethel. Do you know what the word Bethel means? El is another uh, it means God, the one true God. And Beth means house. So Bethel means house of God. It was a city. Five. And he put down the idolatrous priests. He put them down. Where? In the ground. He killed them, people. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained. The king of Judah ordained? No, God has to ordain you. 
whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the moon, and to the planets, and to all the host of heaven. So they burned incense to Satan. They burned incense to the sun and to the moon. You know, to this day, the witches uh, worship the moon. And to the planets and to all the host of heaven. That's the fallen angels. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem and unto the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron and stamped it into stamped it small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. Uh, that basically is defiling it. You know, you graves when you start take something and scatter it in the graveyard, it's defiled. Verse 7, I love this. And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. So the Sodomites had homes, had homes by the, the house of the Lord. He broke, he, he demolished their homes. I wonder if they were inside the homes when he did it. Can you think of a modern application? Hmm. Uh, San Francisco? Verse 8. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah. I should make a, uh, I should make a point here about sodomites. Some people say sodomites can be saved. Others say sodomites cannot be saved. You know, it's not my place to say yes or no, but there is a point where the Lord slams the door shut. I mean, look in the days of Noah, God, when 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 the rain started. I mean, God God was the one that closed the door to the ark. God's hand closed the door of the ark. Noah didn't do it; God did. There reaches a point where that's it where God says, that's it, it's over. You're either inside the ark or you're outside, you're going to drown. And sodomy is rebellion against God. God created Adam, and then he created Eve to be his helper, his helpmate. So when you reject what God made for you. That's rebellion against God. Oh no, I don't want a woman. I want a man, the, the sodomites say. Or some of them are what they call switch hitters. They go both ways. You know, I, I tell you what, there's been a few women that uh, they're crushed when they find out that they're... Uh, husband, boyfriends, whatever, were cheating on them with another man. That's just utterly, I, I can't even imagine. And uh, trust me, I've got a ton of sin from uh, my wild youth. But uh, if that wasn't one of them. But you got to realize that's rebellion against God. Sodomy is rebe open rebellion against God. It's not much different than witchcraft and Satanism. As a matter of fact, a lot of witches and Satanists are into uh, this kind of practices. So, I mean, it's, it's no small thing. There's a reason. And a lot of you might not understand it, but right now, there's a satanic group in Australia. If the information I'm getting from some people from Australia is true, and I think it is, there's a news blackout in the U.S. But there's a satanic group called the OTO, the Golden Dawn. And yes, they're over here. They're an offshoot of the Church of Satan. But they're not, they're not 
playing games like the Church of Satan. These people are serious. They say it's their religious right to uh, have sex with children. It's part of their religion. You ever wonder why all these children are being kidnapped certain times of the year? It happens, people. There's a reason why God commanded witches and sodomites be put to death. Well, guess what? A lot of the politicians, judges, they're supporting this stuff in Australia. There's a trial going on right now. And I bet you the, the uh, Satanists are going to win and say, you know, it's our right to do this. If you were an Australian citizen and you and and you use the words sodomite and pedophile in the same sentence, you could go to jail. Yeah. Who do you think passed those laws? Think about it. Verse 7, and he break down the houses of the sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. You know, God blessed Josiah. And I'm so sick of hearing these churches that are not even churches. They're 501c3 corporations, tax-exempt businesses. And if the state says that you can't discriminate against the sodomites, well, then guess what? If you want to keep your tax exemption from the state, you can't preach against sodomy. And God forbid you tell a couple of sodomites that you don't want to bake a cake for them. They'll bankrupt you. God forbid you don't perform a marriage in your church for a couple of sodomites. If they don't want, they don't want just acceptance. They want to throw it in your face. There's a reason why God said, commanded to do what is not being done in the land. And San Francisco is just unbelievable. There's a pedophile ring of Satanists running rampant in Europe, in England, in the United States, and in Australia. And because it's not on the nightly news, Christians don't believe it. Oh, that's fake news. Really? Really? When's the last time you've ever heard the news uplift the name of Jesus. How about never in my lifetime? And he break down the houses of the sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. And people, if you think God is going to bless and protect you for failing to stand up for these children, that are being killed in satanic sacrifices and being sexual slaves for these monsters. I suggest you read the Old Testament. I suggest you read the book of Judges. I suggest you read the book of Jeremiah. Washington, D.C. is full of these people. And if you think Donald Trump's going to save us from all this, you got another thing coming. Although I was very pleased to hear uh, Melania, if I know, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, uh, when she was in Melbourne, Florida, I grew up there in, in high school, I was very pleased to hear her speech where she uh, quoted from the New Testament. Oh yeah, the, uh, the Antichrist, they don't mind you quoting from the Old Testament. But God forbid you read from the words of Jesus. Look out. Verse 8. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests, the false priests, where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break 
down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places came not up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the, through the fire to Moloch. They took their children and burned them alive to a heathen satanic god named Moloch. And you want to know something? Let's take a look at something. All right, let's take a break real quick. We're going to take a look at the... Uh, all right, so Moloch was... Uh, they were burning their children alive as, as a human sacrifice unto Moloch. This is Judah, people. You know, God's chosen people. In the book of Amos, and I've... Re I, there's a book in the Bible called Amos. It's in the Minor Prophets. Uh, it's in the books just before the New Testament. Almost nobody that I know has read these books. The Minor Prophets, they don't read it. They don't read the mi Major Prophets. They don't read Genesis. They don't read nothing. But boy, they can quote John 3.16. So let's read Amos chapter 5 and verse 26. But ye have born... What does it mean to born? Not, you know, not a child being born. Born as in carrying, you know, carried around. But ye have born the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chion, your images, the star, the star, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Now, there are some people that will tell you that the, the star of Moloch is a five-pointed star. Look on the United States flag. And, of course, our star points up, and then the satanic five-pointed star points down. But if you look on the Israeli flag, guess what? There's a six-pointed star. And if you look... In archaeological books, in the temples of Moloch, you will see carved on the walls a six-pointed star. Who's Amos talking to here? He's talking to Judah, the Jews. He's not talking to a bunch of satanic heathens. Well, they are satanic heathens. But he's talking to Judah because they weren't following the God of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and Chion, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Is there a second verse to this? Yeah. Acts chapter 7, verse 43. Who's, who, are the, who are the apostles talking to here? They're talking to the Jews. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god, Rempham. The word Rempham is sometimes translated as giants. You know, giants, David and Goliath. Who's, who, who are the apostles talking to here? They're talking to the Jews. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of star of your god Rempham, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Mm. So what star do the Jews, even the so-called Messianic ones, carry, uh, 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 you know, the Israeli flag? Think about it. All right, let's take a look back. Let's go back to Kings. 22 Kings 23, verse 10. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, 
which that no man might take, make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Moloch. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son, not the son of God, the sun in the sky, at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. And the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh, that was, he was a bad king, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption, the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built it for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians. Ashtoreth. I believe, if memory serves me correctly, that was one of the names of the goddess Easter, or Ishtar. Which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built it for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Zidonians, and for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. And he brake in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. Oof. Wow. Let's skip down to verse 20. I'm sorry, 19. And all the houses also of the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, that's the capital of Israel, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke, provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. And he slew, he killed, and he slew all the priests of the high places that were there upon the altars and burn men's bones upon them and return to Jerusalem. Boy, we need a King Josiah today, not a Donald Trump. I'm not saying anything good or bad about Donald Trump, but I would rather have a King Josiah, but that's just my opinion. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant, Surely there was not hold in such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor the kings of Judah. See, there were kings of Israel and there were kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein this Passover is holden to the Lord in Jerusalem, moreover, the workers with familiar spirits... That's the devils, those that work with ghosts. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards, that's a male witch, and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and Jerusalem did Josiah put away. He didn't lock them in a closet. He buried these people. That he might perform the words of the law that were, which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. Wow. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah. The Lord's anger was against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which... I have chosen, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did are 
they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Wow. Ah, uh, so, and then Josiah was killed in a battle. All right, let's go back. Well, let's see. Let's, um, I'm doing a little bit of background here. It's, you know, it, it, so much of the Bible ties into the Bible. Now, after Josiah died, they went back to apostasy. God carried him away to Babylon. So let's take a look at son in the Bible. Because the sun's going to be darkened in the last days. And there's a um, an equinox, a solar, I'm sorry, a solar eclipse coming up. Well, let's read a little something uplifting. You know, there's no difference between Israel and Judah of old and, and Europe and the United States. We are just as wicked as they are. But let's read something a little something uplifting psalm 72 uh verse chapter 72 verse 17 his name and i say that name's jesus his name shall endure forever his name shall be continued as long as the sun and men shall be blessed in him all nations shall call him blessed psalm 74 verse 16 the day is thine, the night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Psalms 84 and verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. Didn't Christ, when he walked on the earth, Moses gave us the law, but Christ gave us grace. What is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. God gave me grace. I didn't do anything, nor can I ever do anything to pay back what he did for me. And neither can you. I mean... You know, it's like somebody gives you a, a brand new car for a penny. That's grace, people. Or gives you a brand new car for free, and you give them a penny. It's like, did you, did you earn it? No. No. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And that's what, you know, that's what the golden rule is. Do unto others as others, uh, as you know, as you would have others do unto you. That's walking uprightly. All right, let's take a look. Now, here's an interesting verse. Isaiah chapter 60. In verse 19 and 20, the sun shall be no more thy light by day. Neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light and thy God thy glory. The sun shall be no more thy light by day because the Lord's going to be an everlasting light. Where have we read this? Hmm. Verse 20. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. And when I'm talking about mourning, we're not talking about morning, afternoon, and night. No, we're talking about a close friend or family member dies and you're in mourning, sorrow. 
So let's take a look. When is there not going to be a sun anymore? When's the Lord going to be our light? Well, let's take a look. Well, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23. Now, you can read the entire chapter yourself. I mean, Revelation 21 and 22, are, that's the end. Okay? And the city, what city? Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. Why? Well, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Ooh, the Lamb's going to be the light thereof. Didn't Jesus say in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world? He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. There's not going to be a sun. The Lord's brightness is going to lighten everything. Revelation 22, verse 5. And there shall be no night there. No night. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And when I say rain, I don't mean water falling from the sky. I mean rain as in ruling. So, how's that for an ending? There's going to be a time there's not going to be any sun or moon. Not going to need it. All right, so let's go... So, isn't that pretty interesting? In Isaiah 60, we're, it, Isaiah chapter 60 is talking about the future. Prophecy. There's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament. People, read it. Throw away that TV. Produced by pedophiles and sodomites and Satanists that hate Jesus and you and me. I get them every day on my channel. I probably spend an hour every day on my, at least one hour every day, fighting the Satanists that come to my channel. Promote, provoking their, their filth and whatever. Isaiah 60, 19. The sun shall no more, the sun shall be no more thy light by day. Neither her brightness shall the moon Give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. Okay. In Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 16, we're kind of, well, we'll just read it. And he, God, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. They're in the Lord's house worshipping the sun, not the Son of God, no, the sun up in the sky. Can you imagine that? They're worshiping something that God made, not God. This is why God took them into the Babylonian captivity. All right. In Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 7, now, you can take a look at the whole chapters. All you know, I, I'm trying not to pull verses out of context here. You can read the entire chapters yourself. But in Ezekiel, but I'm trying to make these Bible studies, you know, I think it's going to take 30 minutes and it ends up taking an hour or something, you know. Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 7. And when I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven. 
and make the star stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All right. In Joel chapter 2, verse 10. Now, this, all these Bible studies are getting, I'm getting ready to do a commentary on Joel. But I got to lay the, uh, the background. Joel 2.10. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. Verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, and his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And the answer is, if you're wicked, none of you. All right, let's take a look. Same chapter, uh, Joel 2. And we're going to take a look around verse 30, uh, around verse 30, 29. And also upon these servants and upon the handmaids in those days, what days? The end time, the latter days, the end times. And also upon the servants. And upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. What spirit? The Holy Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Ooh. Didn't the, uh, didn't the Bible say that the sea would be turned to blood in the book of Revelation? Sure does. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. In Joel chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now, for those of you that have been taught by the churches that Israel and Judah is the same people, well, take a look at uh, Jeremiah 3, verse 8. I'm not going to read it. But here's something, Zechariah 11 and verse 14. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. How can you have brotherhood between the same people? You know, Israel and Judah were two different, you know, there was 12 tribes. Judah was one tribe. Israel was like 10 or 11 tribes. I mean, you had Levi. Levi was the tribe of the priests. Uh, Judah was the tribe of the kings. If the king of Israel went into the temple and offered a sacrifice, God would have killed him. There's a difference. And Christ was of the tribe of Judah, a king. And yet he gave us a sacrifice. All right. Remember in Revelation, we said that the Lord would be our light. In Matthew chapter 17, we read about the transfiguration when Moses, the law, and Elijah, 
the prophet, or, you know, they represented the, the law and the prophets. Well, let's take a look. Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Christ was transfigured. His face shined as the sun. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with them. That's the Greek rendering for Elijah. So, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. You see, that's only a, a, a foreshadow. All right, let's take a look in Matthew 24. This is uh, the end times verse. Okay. Let's see. Where are we going to start? Start. Oh, let's see. Verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For... Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together immediately after the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He's not going to be coming as a lamb hanging on a cross. He's going to be coming as a lion with an army. Ooh. All right, let's take a look at Luke 21, which is a parallel account like Mark 13 and Matthew 24. You know, the disciples asked him, uh, what's it going to be like at the end of the world? All right, start in verse Luke 21, 23. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck. In those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath, wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now this was partially fulfilled in 70 AD, but there's an ultimate fulfillment coming. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations where with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Okay. All right, let's go to uh, second chapter of 
the book of Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to take a look at this. Now, I believe, if memory serves me correctly, this is Peter speaking. But I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. You know what? Let's read the entire chapter. Now, all the disciples and believers were all in Jerusalem. Uh, the Lord, I think it was, what, 50 days after the Lord rose from the dead or was crucified? I, I don't, it was like 50 days uh, after either when he was crucified or after he rose from the dead. Uh, the Holy Spirit came. They call it Pentecost. I, I'd have to look up what the uh, Hebrew name for it is. I don't remember offhand. Please understand, the Bible is three quarters of a million words. There's a lot to remember, people. And my memory is not what it used to be. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Do you know in the Greek, the word wind comes from pneuma, as in pneumatic, like pneumatic tools, air tools? That's where we get the word from, Greek. Uh, it's also the same word that they use for spirit. Isn't that interesting? So when people want to take you back to the Hebrew roots, tell them, no, thank you, I don't want Moses who gave us the law, I want Jesus, who gave me grace. I think I'll pick grace over law. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You know what witches and wizards play with? The unholy ghost. I'd rather have the Holy Ghost. What do you think? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews and devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Just think, the Tower of Babel in Genesis, God confused them with the languages. But here, God's letting everybody hear the gospel in their own language. It's the opposite of Babel. Babel, you ever heard uh, Babel, Babel, Babylon? Uh, Babel means confusion. You ever heard a baby doing babbling? It's not saying anything. That's babbling. But here, they're preaching the gospel. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language, and they were all amazed and marvel, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these that speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in his own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontius and Asia, uh, Pargria and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? In other words, what's the meaning of this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. They're a bunch of drunks. Don't listen to them. Yeah, I get those people on my channel every single day. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, 
lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And that's what that's what this this these Bible studies are going to leading to, Joel. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel or Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young, young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I guess that's going to be, I guess I'm going to be getting dreams. And all my servants and all my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Yeshua of Nazareth, no, that's not what G Paul's Peter saying here. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being, deter uh, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye... Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my faith, face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. I did a study on Abraham's bosom. You should check it out sometime. Do you know the Old Testament saints before Christ went to hell? Do you know Jesus went to hell for three days and three nights? Sure he did. What did he do there? He preached to the Old Testament saints and said, I'm the Redeemer, I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah. Believe on me and ye shall live. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me speak uh, freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, Neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus, not Yeshua, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, The Lord said unto my Lord, 
sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Is Jesus Christ the Lord? Peter says he is right here. Is the day of the Lord and the day of Christ two different events? Think about it. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, not the Romans, the house of Israel crucified him. That God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's right. What are we going to do? What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Turn from your wickedness, people. Well, that's the Bob paraphrase. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach? No. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's what it means to be born again of the Spirit, people. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ in you, you can read the Bible all you want. You'll never understand it. Repent to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Nicodemus came to Christ and asked him, and Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that's what this is. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourselves from this wicked group of people. That's what he's saying. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls and they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions of good and parted them to all men as every man had need and they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. Wow. All right, let's continue with Son in the Bible. Uh, let's see, what are we going to do here? And then we're going to go back to Isaiah. All right, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 13. Verse, I guess we'll go back to verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. All right, we're going to pause here. Uh, let me think. Okay. 
All right, let's go to Mark chapter 15. We're going to take a look at the crucifixion real fast. Mark 15, verse 24. And when they had crucified him, who? Christ. They parted his garments, casting lots upon them that every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Darkness. Just like, you know, the sun not giving her light, right? And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Leo, Ma, Leo, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which is being interpreted. Now he's speaking Aramaic and Hebrew here, which is being interpreted. Why are they going to interpret Hebrew? If, if the New Testament was written in Hebrew, not Greek, why is that he, it being interpreted? Because it wasn't written in Hebrew. It was written in Greek. But it's telling you exactly what he said. He said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by, who? Jews, not Romans. And some of them that stood by, when they heard it, said, behold, he calleth Elias. Here it is, you got the Jews standing by. Jesus is speaking Hebrew, and the Jews didn't even understand what he was saying. He's saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And they're saying, behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The veil of the temple separated. It was a block God from the common man, our sins. The veil of the temple only the high priest could go in to the Holy of Holies and only once a year on the Day of Atonement to offer a sacrifice to God. And that veil had to hide us from God because if we looked upon God, we'd die. But here, we've got a mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So the veil of the temple is ripped from the top, heaven, down to the bottom, the earth. We now have access to the Holy of Holies, a sacrifice unto God the Father by his Son. But the Jews, the unbelieving Jews, they don't want this. They want to rebuild their temple. And I think God's going to let them do it. But that's just my opinion. Verse 39. And when the centurion, a Roman soldier... And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Wow. 
Isn't that something? All right. Isaiah 13, verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And it shall be as the chaste roe and as a sheep that hath no man, that no man hath uh, taketh up, and they shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one into his own land. Every one that is found shall be thrust through. That means they're going to take a sword and stick it through them. Every one that is found shall be thrust through, and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Now this is talking about uh, when the Babylonians come and take Jerusalem into captivity. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. Uh, the Babylonians, when they found a good-looking woman, they didn't care if it was a wife, daughter, whatever. If they, you know, soldier marching for weeks, finds a good-looking woman, he just killed her husband, he's going to decide, well, I'm going to have a little bit of fun here. And their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eye shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited. Do you know that the ancient city of Babylon to this day has never been inhabited since the day the Lord allowed it to be destroyed? Listen to this. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. There has been stories that the Arabs refused to pitch their tent on the grounds of ancient Babylon. Refuse. Verse 21, But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons, dragons, in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. All right, we're going to close this out. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came thee? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he, he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them. 
nor any heat. There's not going to be any sun on these people, right? For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them unto living waters, I'm sorry, living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's what's coming, people. So I hope you enjoyed our commentary on Isaiah chapter 13. And uh, basically, we're doing the study on the, the day, the day of the Lord, which is God's wrath and anger against the unbelievers. And this is only part two. We're getting ready to go do part three will be next. So all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ. In his precious name, amen.